I'm James Edward Turnipseed, and I was drafted into the Army Air Corps. Everything was in the Army at the time. The Air Corps and the Marines, everything at the time of World War II was under the Army. But when I got drafted, all branches of service were open, so I had a choice, and I took the Air Corps. Well, now, I was still a civilian at the time. And, and my neighbor said, don't worry about it, the war will be over, they won't get you. When I got 18, they got me. <laughs> I heard it on the radio, and it, it, was, it was like it is now when something drastic happens. Every station had it all the way down. I didn't feel too good, but I was young, and I didn't think it would ever affect me. But the thing of it was, we had already started drafting men, but even before Pearl Harbor. But they had that thing, I'll be back in a year, little darling. You remember that song? Well, that, they were drafted for a year. And that was supposed to be it. And then later on, the draft was for the duration. And I was drafted for the duration. After I was drafted, I, I was sent to Gulfport to basic training. And we went through a period of several weeks of basic training. I was supposed to graduate and go to radio school, but the school wasn't open at the time. So we did our basic training over again until the school opened. And I went to Scottfield, Illinois to radio school. And then I, I, I wound up in, in uh, California doing air-to-ground radio contact and we flew all over the Himalaya, I mean the, the mountains in the uh, western part of the state. We didn't know at the time that we were being conditioned to fly over the Himalayas. So later on, after I graduated from that air ground school, we crewed up and did a new airplane and we carried it overseas. Went down through South America and across to Africa and up to North Africa and over to India and there we carried the new plane and then we were assigned to a base. And then from there, I, I do my flying. And I was a, a radio operator, and I liked the plane. It, it had everything in it that I liked. So that's what we flew over the hump in, and it was good plane for the weather because it had a good, strong engine. The problem flying over the hump was weather. The Japanese had Burma captured, and the, the Burma road was cut off, so everything had to be flown over. And our, our main thing was to supply the B-29s while they were bombing Japan. That was primary. And secondary was to haul anything that needed to be hauled, including evacuations when the Japanese took over a town. So we kept stayed busy. The biggest problem we had, the manufacturer of the airplane had a cargo limit, the total weight. They ignored that and overloaded it and burned up the engines regularly. It, it was a kind of a fight between the generals and we was a result of it. I flew 60 flights from India to China over the Himalayas, known as the Hump, and then I flew 45 flights in, in uh, eastern uh, China and south China and uh, China Sea. I got to see 39 different towns or their air bases or their landing strips where we were, so I had a real good tour duty and then when it comes to the August of 45, my outfit had a rumor that the war was over. Japan had surrendered. He called me and another person in said, I've got your orders to go home, but get out of China today. The warlord had us, uh, sent us a note, had us outnumbered 16 to 1, not to take anything off the base. If you two guys will catch the mail plane and get over to Burma tonight, get out of China, or else you may be stranded for another couple of months. So we left. We hitchhiked all the way to India to Karachi. And at Karachi, we was picked up on priority and brought home. Well, you was on call 24 hours a day. You never knew when they would ask you to go out on flight. And you never knew where you was going until you got your orders. But we didn't, we, we, we were flying 
three-man crews. All we had was pilot, co-pilot, and radio operator. So the radio operator and the co-pilot had to do a lot of the dirty work, and including we hauled a lot of 55-gallon drums of aviation gas over, and if one leaked, we had to throw it out. And the, the co-pilot and myself had to throw it out. <laughs> I was young back then, and, and things, things didn't add up to anything discouraging. I thought it was a ball. And looking back on it, it was a ball, but it wasn't a very good ball because my outfit, a small outfit, only lost one airplane to the Japanese Zeros, and that was in December of 44. Other than that, we lost them running into the mountains. They're running out of gas. So the nearest thing we had to radar was, was radio compass. You, you could you could you could get a beam from a from a station and know what direction he was from you. That was the nearest thing we had, and we had to use a lot of Morse code, the the continuous wave, because you'd get into the mountains and the the static was so bad you couldn't use voice. So we had to use the Morse code to send messages back and forth, and that was my primary training. I I, I learned Morse code forty words a minute, send and receive. <laughs> There was one morning we were flying back from China to India, and, and the ground fog, that was terrible. The ground fog would just all of a sudden just come in, and you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Well, we, we didn't have enough gas to circle around, find a place to land, and we just kept circling around. We didn't know where, where everything was. So the pilot come on the intercom and said, you and the co-pilot get on your parachute and get ready to bail out. So we did, and we opened the door, and we were standing back there ready to go. He said, I'll let you know I'm coming back. He come back, and he said, I think I found a place to land. Come on back. So, <laughs> so as the nearest I come to bailing out, but we did land. We flew on instruments. As soon as we took off before we got to Burma, where the Japanese were, we'd go into the clouds and go on instruments. Well, the Zeros didn't have that thing. They couldn't fly in the... They had to get you when they could see you, so that's how we escaped them. To begin with, we had escorts till we got to, to the overcast, but then later on they dropped the escorts. So it, it worked out real good, I thought. I can remember <clears throat> one time we had to evacuate a town that the Japanese was about to take over, and there was a lot of missionaries there, all different denominations, and we hauled a load of missionaries, the, the women and the children, but the men stayed there. And we hauled them back to, to Kunming, which was a dis distribution point, and then they went back to their uh, country, whether it was Germany or wherever, they all went back. But I, I, I really did enjoy bringing them home. I really did. That, that was something that I accomplished. We tried to, to parachute mules into the jungle, but they broke their legs every time. The jungles, they couldn't use it uh, to rent the, the vehicles. They had to more or less walk and carry it. And we, they thought the mules would be a, a pack burden that they could carry. But we, we, we never could su successfully parachute them down. Now, we picked them up if we had a landing strip and hauled them out. That, was, that wasn't no problem. Fact is, I think the horses hauled better than the men did. We hauled everything that needed hauling. See, the, the new model had that big door. We could take a Jeep apart and put it in there. And then we, <coughs> we hauled bombs, and we hauled back something to begin with that the Chinese, Chinese people loaded us with to come back. It was something you put in steel to make it stronger. Molybdenum or something, I don't know what the name was. It was, a, it was a chemical that was in bars, and they were real heavy, and we bolted them down to the floor and brought them back. We did that for a while, and then they cut that out. But anything that needed hauling, we hauled. We, we, took, we hauled the, the Chinese army out of Burma over the rivers down to, in, in the east of China to meet the Japanese, and we hauled them and their horses, the cavalry, on the airplanes. We blindfolded the horses and let them up a ramp. So we, but, they, but the trouble was, when we had, a, a, say, 60 Chinese troops that we were going to haul, they all got air sick. And talking about a smell, that's the worst I've ever run into. <laughs> but now on Christmas Day, 1944, I had a trip out from Chanyi, China, to uh, Mission Burma. And, and we got started late summer. I ate breakfast, I knew that, and, and got up there. And for somehow, we got delayed, and we stayed there until it was almost nighttime. And we got ready to fly back. 
and this guy, uh, the CO down at Solmar down south of uh, Mission, uh, he said, would you guys mind bringing us the supplies and the mail on your way home? He said, we, we missed the airplane today. And he said, sure, we'd be glad to take them on our way home. So they was about 70 miles south. So we got up there and we started to land and that ground fog come in. Ooh, you couldn't see nothing. Our pilot, he was he was headed to the runway. He, did, he didn't abort. He just come on down and we landed. And he pulled off to the runway and we didn't know where we were, couldn't see nothing. And we slept in the plane that night. We didn't have nothing to eat all day Christmas. And the next morning, the fog lifted and the guy came down the jeep. He said, we thought y'all guys went on home. We didn't know he landed. He said, get in the jeep and let's go eat. And they had killed a deer talking about good eating. We really ate that morning. But we missed the Christmas dinner. The problem we had, we had a, an agreement, lend lease or whatever they call it, with China. They fed us and housed us. And <clears throat> they wrote off the war debt like $10,000 a day per person because it was millions and they didn't want it hanging over there. They just It was just a write-off. So they fed us more eggs than anything I can make. <laughs> and water buffalo steak was so tough you could just chew it up and spit it out. And then they had something that I loved. It looked like wheat. About so high, it grew up so high, and they cut it off, and they cooked it with a little seasoning, and it was good. Now, the Chinese fed us. Now, we fed the Chinese army. We hauled Louisiana rice to China <laughs> to feed the Chinese army while we lived on. <laughs> it was a strange situation. Well, the thing I thought about it after so many months and years of the time, that the war wasn't going to ever end. And <laughs> they're just going to keep us away till you got killed. Well, I'd, I'd already fulfilled my obligation, 650 hours in the air. You're supposed to come home. I had 850, and I was still there waiting on a replacement. You know how I got a replacement? A man in the motor pool wanted to be a radio operator. And my commanding officer said, are you willing to train him? I took him out on two trips over the hump and a lot of time on the ground explaining all the aircraft, and I checked him out, and there was my replacement. I got to come home. <laughs> well, the problem was I came out on priority. My priority wasn't for number one. So we were flying from Karachi to North Africa, and I stayed in North Africa for several weeks waiting on my priority to come up. And finally, in Casablanca, we got on a C-54 airplane and flew all the way to Miami. And I came home. But, the, but the, all the, the celebrating was over with by then. When we got home after the war, we were due a 45-day furlough. Well, I, I got that. I went to Nashville. That's what I didn't think of. That's Nashville where we picked up that new airplane. I went back to Nashville, and then they sent me home for 45 days. And, and that's, that's when I met Ann while I was home on furlough. <laughs> and then, then I had to go back to Nashville. And then they evaluated your number of points, how much you was overseas, the number of months, and the medals you got and all that. And then it gave you a priority number. So I had enough priority, and they sent me down to Maxwell Field, Alabama, to be discharged. And, and, and we met in a, in a building there. It was for a little old room. It was full of people. And every day, several of them got discharged, and they kept on. Finally, it was down to me by myself. And I... I, call, I went up and asked, I said, what's the problem? He said, you're not here. My, my credentials had fallen from the book, from the, uh, the drawer in the behind. And he said, I'm sorry, I apologize, but you'll get out of here today. So they, <coughs> they discharged me. And by the way, I, I got my medals, in, in addition to all the medals that I got, I got two air medals and a distinguished flying cross. And then all of those other bear star, uh, battle stars, all that added up to enough to get discharged. So as I got to Maxwell Field, they discharged me that day, and I got on a bus and came home, and the bus came right up within a block of my house, and I got off and walked home. And my parents, my mother, <laughs> she was just crying for joy. <laughs> It'd take a while for me to adjust back to being a civilian. I, I'll have to say that because... We had been told what to do all in many years, and now you made a choice of what you wanted to do. So it was a little bit difficult, but I, I kind of pushed that back out of my mind and tried to get organized. And I finally got a job. I got a job and went back to work regularly. So World War II kind of faded out until it began to surface again when I saw my buddies again. 
I, I kept that with, with the, the, there, was, there was three of us radio operators, and in in, actually there was four of us in the same tent in Lulian, China, and we were flying reverse. We flew over to India and got the gas and come back. But I kept, I found them after 50 years of being discharged, I found them on the computer, a friend for them, and we met with two of them down in, in New Orleans, and we had a ball, and we kept up with each other until they died. They all died now. I'm the only one left. <laughs> but I, I did go to what they call the Hump Pilots Association. I joined it, and that was all the people that was over there during the war, and we met in a different city each year. And a lot of the pilots that I'd flown with, I got to see again, and we knew it. It was, and Ann got to go with me, and we, we really enjoyed it. But they dismantled that in, in 2005 because people were too old to travel. It, it means a whole lot. It really does. Especially those that, from Vietnam that got spit on when they came back. That just irks me something awful the way they were treated. So when their day comes up to be honored, I honor them.